this is ADHD brain for you. Um, it was interesting with Mark doing the clicker earlier. For the last two people, I realised, um, you know, and I mentioned this actually before, and it, it brought it back to my head again that um, to someone else outside, that like 16 years ago, um, I actually had um, AI for my television. I had a, a you know a voice controlled interface, and she was called Molly, and she was six, and she had the remote control, and I'd say BBC Two, please, Molly. And Gudunk, and she wrote for Freddo's. She was brilliant. Um, <laughs> so if you don't have a system, just get a small child. They work just as well. Um, so, yes, try to get back on track. <laughs> She's now 21. She wouldn't mind me saying that. <laughs> um, right, OK. Uh, here we go. So BBC, yes, I've already done all that bit. Um, BBC is an interesting organisation, so I've been with it for 14 years, did not join to do accessibility, and that's an entire, I used to make TV trails, um, but we have on our passes, we have certain things called the BBC values that are stuck on the back of it, uh, values, it's always a running joke if anyone watches uh, uh, W1A, uh, but these things do exist, and, uh, and, and they're, they're quite straightforward, but the, the second one is actually where a lot of the missions, and it comes from other places as well, within our policy around accessibility comes from. And it says audiences are at the heart of everything we do. We start with people and we work towards what we're going to do. Um, and this is a really, really important point. Uh, this is Tony Hall, by the way. Uh, it's a picture of Tony Hall. He's the Director General of the BBC. I'm not just going to necessarily talk about Tony, but talk about all the Director Generals because they all refer back to these values. We all look at policy and we discuss stuff. It's fascinating because I've never had a conversation really with a director general of why we do accessibility. It's always about how. Um, and it's one of those things. It's, I'm going to do a little bit of whistle-stop tour of, of accessibility to the BBC, but it's been in the fabric of the organisation really for, for, for decades. Um, and last time when, when I, I did meet Tony, I didn't go for a muffin with Tony, if anyone watches WNA, you'd get that. But we... <laughs> but we um, I was explaining to him, and it's an interesting point that Robin and, and a couple of other people have made earlier, that actually accessibility isn't necessarily a disability-related thing. It's a mainstream thing. And we were, we were near the newsroom in New, uh, New Broadcasting House, and we were talking about uh, subtitle provision. And, uh, and I thought, this is a great point, place to make a point. And I said, just look at the news floor. And there's about 300 odd journalists down there, all working, middle of the day. It's incredibly busy. There are screens everywhere. And every single one of them has got subtitles switched on. It's an open plan office. You can't turn the sound up. So it's a real problem uh, for those journalists to access that stuff and have conversations at the same time and stay in touch with stuff. So I said they've all become you know, hearing impaired by their environment. And if we weren't subtitling all our news feeds at this moment, they would have a really difficult time doing their job. It is mainstream. So something Tony actually did say when he joins, and they all say, every, every new director general has a speech to all of the staff. We have like an internal thing, uh, an internal uh, um, uh, TV channel, um, which gets switched on every now and again. Oh, we subtitle everything, it's great. Um, and he talks to the entire staff, and members of the staff can talk back and ask questions directly back to the director general, which they have to answer then in front of all of the staff. Some very, very awkward questions are asked. And he said something very, very important right in the first speech. And he said, at the core of the BBC's role is something very simple, very democratic, and very important, to bring the best to everyone. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whether you are rich or poor, old or young, that is what we do. Everybody deserves the best. And I thought it was quite a nice way. I've never heard someone state it in that way. And I went back to him and I said, well, actually, accessibility is part of the delivery to everyone. And so, really, that's kind of what our role is, to enable that everybody to happen. At which point I went to my line manager and asked if I could change my title to the head of everyone. And uh, I'm still the head of accessibility. Um, <laughs> um, and, and even then, the exec, they have this accessibility statement. There's a couple of slides. I won't talk through them. But they, they're links on, and I know the slides will be shared, and you can get onto um, uh, the web and find this stuff. But there are a couple within the accessibility statement, which are really important. And it says, ensuring that accessibility training is provided for all relevant staff to ensure accessibility is embedded into the design and development of future products and services, and ensuring accessibility is core to designing or procuring products and services. Now, these are really, really important because the, actually the BBC um, is exempt from the Equalities Act for its digital services. It's all public service broadcasters are. We argued the case for that many years ago and won it. 
We said because what we want to do is we don't think it goes far enough and we want stronger policy than the law and we want to deliver against the policy. If you give us the law, we will give you what the law states, but we don't think the law goes far enough. Um, and so that was an interesting state. But we have regular conversation with the government to prove that we actually are in that position. And uh, I'll show you some of the stuff that we do. So we've always worked with audiences going all the way back from uh, the early days of, of putting up uh, test cards to enable people to calibrate TVs in the early days. Um, and we've always delivered stuff around, you know, sort of pro pro programs and services. So accessibility from a BBC point of view started out as content. Um, 1964, four deaf children uh, was the first uh, signed TV children's program. Uh, 1961, oh, by the way, uh, thanks uh, very much, Mike Townsend. I've, I've, been, I've learned a lot about the BBC wherever he's sat now, if he's still in the room, he's... Okay. Yeah, over there, thank you. <laughs> I had a history lesson about In Touch earlier. Uh, it did start in 1961, and Peter apparently was not involved from 1961, so he's not as old as I thought. Sorry, Peter. Um, it was um, David Scott Blackhall. Well done, David Scott Blackhall, because it's still going, and it's still an incredibly uh, popular programme. Vision On, which I remember, uh, started in 1964. I'm not quite that old. Um, which brought in BSL as well into even a wider children's audience. Um, News Review for the Deaf started also the same year in 1964, so our first sign interpreted TV programming for the news. Um, and it moved on and on and on. I mean, there's been so many examples through it. Uh, one that I, I also would like to pick up as well ah, is uh, it's an incredibly blurred slide, apparently, of a Babel fish, um, but it's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy did something very important, which we don't often talk about in terms of accessibility. So Hitchhiker's Guide, for those who know it, started out as a radio program, and they basically took the radio script and filmed it, which basically meant it didn't need describing because all the description was already in the script because it thought there wasn't any pictures. I mean, there was... And then additional stuff that was enrichment, but it actually wasn't necessary. There's, it's by, we call it bi-media production, and we do it in all our journalism, which is why we never have audio description in our journalistic output. It's all described, um, which then frees up all of that resource to do AD for drama and factual, and it means more of our output is accessible. We have Mr. Tumble, uh, who's a personal favourite of mine, and for everyone else under the age of five. Um, <laughs> he's awesome. Uh, he's a complete rock star for the under five year olds. I, I, it's the loudest noise I have ever heard in my life is about a hundred small children screaming when he walked into a room. Uh, Mr. Tumble, if you don't know him, he speaks Makaton uh, in all his programming. It's one of the biggest shows that we've got for the under sixes. Um, and yeah, it's just absolutely amazing. And we've got basically now got a generation of small children speaking Makaton. And this is a really important thing because they meet peers who need to communicate using Makaton. And then that breaks those barriers down. We also get complaints from parents who says, thank you very much for teaching our small children a secret language. We haven't got a clue what they're saying to each other. Um, but this is really, really important stuff around mainstreaming accessibility. Um, something else as well from the history is we started working back in, it was 1973, 74, uh, working with Southampton University um, on a, a teletext was being developed at the time and the first closed captioning system was being developed alongside that which ended up launching in 1978 I think it was um, and uh, sometimes it doesn't always go well I'll explain this slide uh, it's my favorite we, we we often get lambasted for the mistakes in in subtitling and this wasn't a mistake it's actually a picture of Kanye West at, at Glastonbury uh, it was a meltdown, I think, by someone who was subtitling, and he just put, he raps. I don't think he could take it anymore. <laughs> we were all feeling it. It was fine. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and this has kind of marched on into to iPlayer. So I was there at iPlayer 1, and one of the things that we said at iPlayer 1, it has to be as least as accessible as TV. So getting the subtitles out there was incredibly important, as well, you know. And it was broken in many and wonderful ways and people hadn't done it before and, and we're now you know we, we subtitle actually sort of not just the broadcast stuff that's out on iPlayer but all of the iPlayer first as well and we're kind of marching on this other stuff interesting stuff which I won't go down that rabbit hole around iPlayer on accessibility. Um, subtitles also kind of march, marching on from us now as well so we've got this huge challenge that not everything is long-form content 
and we have these automatically matched subtitles. You come across, the, you're going to start coming across this more and more, um, where R&D have built a technology that takes a clip, takes an audio fingerprint of the, uh, of the clip, uh, knows from the metadata, probably in the archive where the program was, goes off and retrieves those programs, creates audio fingerprints for those, slices out the bit that looks like the most candidate, rips out the uh, subtitles and remarries it back up to the, to the clip and puts it out live. And we did it on Bite Size quite recently, and it automatically and accurately generated 4,000 subtitle files. Um, and it's also on the David Attenborough app with Worldwide. It did about, about 900 odd files absolutely accurately in the first go. This is not production ready, this is still trial, but we are looking at how to do these kind of things at scale because this stuff is expensive. This is kind of my world. Uh, I do guidelines a lot, uh, I do other stuff. Um, but the mobile accessibility guidelines are fairly well known. We know other organizations use them. We don't build them for everyone else. Um, they're there because what we, the BBC has to be open about how it does stuff. Um, so our guidelines actually are a reflection of what we do rather than what we try and do. So we say with our guidelines, and also right at the beginning, it's, you know, there is a page on there that says this is about help working for and supplying the BBC. Um, you know, go and use whatever you like, but this is about us. And it actually reflects best practice that is already happening rather than is used to something that defines best practice. Does that make sense? Can't think that makes sense. So um, we don't police accessibility in that way. We just reflect it within the guidelines. So someone new comes along and finds out, you know, wants to actually read about it. Um, people do sit down and read guidelines. It's, it's a tough task. Um, but we try and make them as friendly as possible. Um, also, a lot of the stuff is, is, is designed, is um, embedded within other parts of our guidelines. So global experience language, all our design related stuff was in, in there. And there's accessibility within our editorial guidelines. There's accessibility all over the place. It's embedded in, in the mainstream of what we do. Um, so the way we kind of approach accessibility is, is instead of telling people to deliver against guidelines, we train them and then use guidelines as the reference material for the training so everyone understands what it is. And we have literally hundreds of developers and designers. You can't police stuff at the scale that we do. Um, so we give them all the base knowledge and then beyond that base knowledge of the training course, we then have champions within that. So we, we, anyone who's actually interested in accessibility and they, they then come to us and they go, I want to learn all about this. Um, and we go and talk to their line manager and says, can this be part of their personal development plan? Can they be the voice of accessibility within team project? Or there might be multiple voices. And they can be doing anything. They can be a designer, a developer, product manager, quality assurance tester. They could be a business analyst. They could be all sorts of different things. And so we train them within their role. And so they don't take responsibility for accessibility, but they make sure in every sprint, at every part, the conversation is happening. We have 150 of these people uh, within the organization, and they support each other. We provide the tools and Slack channels and all sorts of stuff. And we find someone in children's goes, oh my god, the wheels are coming off over here on something. And then someone in news goes, ha ha, that happened to us six months ago. Here's a fix. And they fix each other's problems and teach each other, and we kind of facilitate that. We do other stuff that's very, very specific project. Um, so on the slide here is, is actually a bunch of fonts. Um, it's There's BBC Reed Sands at the top, Ariel Gill Sands, which is our, currently our corporate font, uh, but not for much longer, Tiresias, which is the broadcast, uh, is the broadcast subtitle font, and uh, Helvetica. We decided that none of the ones below actually met what we needed as our requirements around readability and legibility. Um, and the exec gave us the opportunity to, to create our own font, and accessibility has been absolutely at the core of the development of it. Um, and I could do half an hour on this, but I won't. But if you want to know more, um, please get in touch with me, and then I can poke you in the direction of all sorts of different things and explain all the stuff that we've done within that. So there's some future stuff that's going on here as well at the BBC. So when we're going to start, <laughs> you know, I'm going to get back to what I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, so you know, we, we're constantly looking at new forms of content. You know, we start and we, we do them with the, the the least obvious audiences. So like our first second screen application was done on a trial was with the Antiques Roadshow, which is an obvious match <laughs> when you think about the demographic. You know, so we're going to go for an older audience 
who have not not tech savvy at all. And it was a play along thing about guessing prices and all sorts of stuff. Hugely popular. I think we had to extend the trial for about a year just because of pop popular demand from the users going, don't switch it off, it's fun. And, um, and so that ran for quite a while, but we actually realized then actually, you know, sort of looking at early adopters, looking at the younger audience, looking at the obvious things, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be looking at this as a very, very holistic thing. And people, when they get ahead around it, have a lot of fun with these things. This has kind of turned into, there's an incredibly dull slide up here. Uh, it says, companion screen and streams DVBCSS. Um, it's turned into a, a, a BBC developed standard, which we're hoping will we'll start to appear within TVs. I think Panasonic might have already done this, and others will follow. Um, as a, 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 it's a, a technical specification for second screen synchronization, which allows us to do really cool stuff, and particularly around accessibility. Again, this is another presentation. Um, but it enables us to reinvent access services. It ena will enable us to do things like um, deliver on-screen graphics in accessible formats to a second screen. So, you know, someone something comes up on the news, you've then got in the data in front of you. And you can play with it. It won't just suddenly disappear after five minutes from an inaccessible format that it was, you know, after five seconds, sorry, rather five minutes. So we can start doing loads of really, really cool stuff. So that kind of stuff happens. Oh, yes, I thought I'd take this slide out. Yeah, we did do actually something a while ago. It ended up in the Daily Telegraph because we had built a Dalek. There's a thing about the BBC is you get enough engineers in a room and it all turns to Doctor Who. And it was like, what are we going to build that's not in a browser? A Dalek. Yay, we built a Dalek. And uh, she was lovely. Apparently she was a she, um, according to Penny, who was one of the engineers. Uh, I didn't know they had gender, um, but this one did. And she was great. And we could, using this technology, deliver... All sorts of stuff. We could choreograph her, send a you know, script and all the rest of it. And she became an extra actor in the room. Um, I like, just went through my head. It's a whole new generation of children with even worse nightmares. Um, <laughs> but this was pure R&D. This is pure, at the moment, this is all exploration and a lot of fun around this. But it will, uh, it will enable us to build and create new accessible experiences. Uh, back to Mr. Tumble again. Games are a big thing for us. And this is where I'm going to start with a little bit about the artificial intelligence. So they are social currency for children. Um, one thing we realized, we've always done accessible games, but we did mainstream games as well. And there's just something fundamentally wrong with this. When you look at things like Vision On and Mr. Tumble and Magic Hands and so many other things, we're trying to mainstream within our broadcast output accessibility, and yet we were segregating within our games. And so we've kind of changed this over the last three or four years and saying actually all our games have to be as inclusive as they possibly can, which has become quite a large project. And building our own games engine, building all of the technologies that we need to enable to do this to actually understand not only is this an accessible gaming pattern, but is it fun? It's one of the things we learned now, is there was so we were, people were building accessible games that were just boring, you know, and children are the, they're the most critical audience. You know, you put something, there's six months of your life in front of them, and five-year-old just walks off and goes, that was rubbish, and that's, <laughs> you go home, have a bit of a cry and start again, um, and they are absolutely awesome, and, and the latest one of those is the Pablo game that's just come out, for people who don't know Pablo, it's on CBBC, uh, CBBS. Um, it's actually not only is all the talent uh, autistic kids, it's actually all of the storylines and creation that happens are from those children. It's autistic kids creating programs for autistic kids that are mainstreamed and it's incredibly popular. And we've created our first game off the back of it using those same kids. And it's really good fun. And we try to make it as accessible. But also the thing is, is to teach all of the children something about autism within there. So it has to be on that educational level. So there's lots of other stuff. 3D radio. I shouldn't have put this in there. I could rant about 3D radio, but there's a lot of stuff about binaural, actual three-dimensional radio. Put your hear, headphones on, and you are in three-dimensional space. Um, we did the prongs in 3D quite recently. Um, so you can see it's called binaural. Binaural recording's been around for decades, probably. Yeah, yeah, it is decades. Um, but we've now creating it so we can actually mix it in the digital space and move you around. Great thing is that, you know, we're also doing 360 and all sorts of stuff. We're doing virtual reality. This is from Turning Forest uh, as an image. And this was also, the thing is, it's virtual reality with three-dimensional audio. 
And one of the biggest problems with VR at the minute is it's so much of it is stereo. So from a vision impaired point of view, you, it's just like, well, it's just like listening to the TV. You don't get a three dimensional experience, but to move through that space visually and audibly at the same time <laughs> is something that we're really quite excited about around accessibility. As one person pointed out when we, we demoed a lot of this stuff to him and, and he's been blind from birth and he just said, I just want a first person shooter with this because I'll have you. <laughs> um, but yes, so it's those kind of technologies are then going to be massively enabling. Echo and home. I, I bung these two things in there. There's an enormous amount of discussion going on around delivering services on these, the, these devices. And people are talking about conversational interfaces. And I keep pointing out, if you want to have a conversation with these, you're going to, have a, you're going to be sorely disappointed. It's very limited. Um, you know, it's all about, I mean, someone earlier said it's, it's that, uh, uh, is it an uh, intelligent assistant rather than a conversational interface, which is quite accurate. Um, one thing I must say to them is don't, don't ever get sarcastic and angry with these things because it's a machine learning nightmare. You know, as soon as it, it does it wrong for the fifth time, you go, that's great, thank you. I'm really enjoying this now. It, it then goes in its head, yay, and then it does it again. <laughs> So yes, yeah, sarcasm, machine learning. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'd love to hear about what Watson does with sarcasm. Uh, uh, that'd be great. And it was from a Mancunian as well, like myself, and we're pretty sarcastic. So <laughs> there must be something in there. Some of the stuff that also around IA is really, really important is all of the other stuff that's happening too. The BBC is becoming a login service. This is kind of really important, and it's going to be really important around accessibility for us because we need to know more about the individual user. We need to know, and, and one of the points I forgot to make about the children's stuff is the children's games are learning about the child. One of the things in some of our games we, we tried out is if a child, within, there's all sorts of different stuff that we try and do. You know, all the games have got an educational element to it, and they're fun as well. And if a child gets to a point like on a Mr. Tumble game and Mr. Tumble fails to do the jump or grab the balloon or whatever they're supposed to do, um, we never make it the child's fault, by the way. It's always Mr. Tumble's fault. And he's, Ooh, I'm really silly. And, uh, and so the, the, there's no pressure put on the child and the child doesn't feel like they've failed. And there's also like a no-fail mode in all games. So they can just hit a space bar and things happen. The thing is, we just thought if they constantly don't quite finish the task, we can then, the game can then go, huh, they're struggling. Maybe we make the target size a bit area, a bit bigger. Maybe we hint and make something flash over here because they're not, you know, they're not doing it or make it a noise over there um, because they're not seeing it. Or we, we try and give them, we start adding more richness to the game to kind of help them move on. Biggest problem we had, and this is again with adding those kind of things to it, is, is five minutes. Is, <laughs> oh, train of thought's completely gone. That's it. Is, um, the, the thing is, failing was so much fun, the kids were doing it on purpose. So it completely undermines the help that we're trying to give to the children. And that's one of these massive things, is what if people, are, people are, human beings are not really that predictable. They will do something. If you give them enough incentive, they will do the, you know, something that you're totally totally unaware they will do it. And kids will, you know, you buy them a toy, they take it out of the box, they get in the box. That's the problem with children. <laughs> and all that work that went into designing the game, we may as well have just given them a box because that was way more fun. And this is what they were doing. So they were playing with games in the ways that we weren't expecting them to play. There's other stuff happening as well that's going to be really, really important. So object-based broadcasting is something, I don't know if anyone has heard of that. Anyone heard of object-based broadcasting? Object-based broadcasting is basically um, deconstructing broadcast. So within a TV program, say within the audio, it's not just a stereo mix anymore. It's within it, we have tracks for the speech, we have tracks for the background noise, we have tracks for all different diff parts of it. We also have metadata, we have ideas that actually the program is segmented into this is the subject here, this is the subject here, this is the subject there. We can deconstruct the program into its component parts. They're the objects. The interesting stuff that if we have login and we have information about people's habits or the time they've got, usually at this time they'll watch for about five minutes, which means they're probably going off somewhere else. We can then shorten the program for them. <laughs> you know, make something fit within their time frame. If we understand more about that person's habits, we can, within object-based recording, we can actually start tailoring the content to fit in with their habits rather than forcing them to an hour or a half an hour. So object-based stuff is incredibly interesting for us. It also means you can pull parts from different programs together and create a new program. 
on the fly based on, on, on someone's, an individual's requirement. And all of this has got to have our head behind it. We've got to learn and create systems. And there is a lot of stuff going on. And I know there's a lot of partner programs within R&D. But understanding what IA can do and what it can't do is that whole is, is so, so important at this point um, for us as an organization. So the last kind of thing I want to talk about really is, and, and raise a few things, is not only is this kind of reinventing us, push and pull I've put up on here on the screen, which is like, when we talk about content, we're either pushing, you, pushing content to you or you're pulling it from us. Um, and so this is the difference between online and TV. You know, when you switch on the TV, you usually don't know what you want to watch. Most people go there without programming. They just stick BBC One on or ITV on or whatever they like. And, uh, yeah, and they move on from that. They start with brands. They start with channels. This is lean back experience. They let us program to them majority of the times. And a lean forward experience is they're turning up with an agenda, which you do with VARD, which is what you do online. You never just switch on Google and go, uh, give me something. It won't give you anything. You have to drive. And this is the IA with all of these things are going to start giving us things that are in the middle. Whereas we're working with you based on not just stuff that you're making decisions on now, but based on stuff that you've given us through data. And then it's going to become this kind of much better working push-pull relationship. So I'm kind of right at the end now. And... I think there's, there's a huge amount of opportunity here. Um, one of the things that I'm kind of most I I interested in from an accessibility point of view are a couple of things. Well, there's actually a, a worry for me. One of my worries, particularly around conversational interfaces, um, is that they become overlays for visual interfaces. I hear too much going, oh, we could what this on an EPG. It's like, no, no, no. EPGs are dreadful UX, even for a sighted person. And then trying to stick a completely different UX in audio on top of a really bad piece of design in the first place is just going to be a car crash of user experience. But the interesting thing about some of these devices that we've got coming through from the manufacturers is that they're, they're asking some really good fundamental questions about the UX from an absolute starting point. And so when this becomes visual and we're, we're, you know, we've, we've started from an audio point of view, it's got to follow the lead of what we're learning from the audio. It's got to go audio into visual rather than visual and then trying to create audio off the back of it. I think there's, there's going to be some very, very interesting sort of successes and failures in this way over the next few years. And that, for me, is going to be something that's going to be interesting from our own UX point of view of how we tackle it. And the other thing is I think there's disenfranchised audiences at the moment that are going to really benefit from this. I've talked about children. Children are going to really benefit from conversational interfaces because children very early on learn to demand, I want this, so they can talk to this. And when it gets wrong, they just go, no. And uh, no is a, a word they learn very quickly, and they, they can get a heck of a lot from it. Um, the other thing is older audiences who can't use assistive technologies or people who struggle with assistive technologies because they're too complicated. <laughs> Having something that's more humanistic and more, it feels, you know, sort of easier for them as a mode of, of, of interaction is going to create quite a lot of opportunities. And again, this is such early days and, and you know, we're busy watching other organisations and listening to other organisations and listening to our audiences and trying to understand how that's going to work. Um, and I think, the, uh, I can't remember if someone made the point up here or made the point out there, um, cognitive accessibility here is, is, it's a big buzzword in the accessibility community is around cognitive accessibility and no one's really nailed what we mean by it, but I've got the feeling within this, and a lot of other people are of the similar mind, there are huge opportunities for us to understand this because this is all based around sort of human thought patterns and interactions, etc. and we can start understanding how cognitive impairment, people like myself, if you want, because I'm ADHD, double deficit dyslexic, I think I've already explained it, or you've already guessed it, because I don't shut up, um, <laughs> is, it's one of those things, it's gonna, I'm going to find it fascinating of how it's going to enable me to actually explore things uh, and interact with things in a much better way and other people. So really, uh, that's it. Um, for once, I've actually, if I, am I on time? Please stop now! <laughs> Thank you.